My name is Alex Poole. I'm an assistant professor at Drexel University's College of Computing and Informatics. I thank all of you for being here today. The title of my talk is Seeking Social Justice in the Archives. My research area is focused heavily on this topic and I'm very excited to share some thoughts with you about it. I'd like to give you a sense of where my talk will be going in the next few minutes that we spend together. First, I'd like to define several key terms. Second, I'd like to discuss rather broadly archives importance. Third, I'd like to provide some historical context. Fourth, I'd like to discuss specific cases that stem from my research. First, I'd like to discuss Jim Crow archives or segregation in the archives. Second, I'd like to highlight the life and work of Harold T. Pinkett, the first African American archivist at the National Archives. Third, I'd like to discuss feminism, specifically the role of second wave feminism in the archival profession in the 1960s and onward. Finally, I'd like to discuss LGBTQ and the rise of gay and lesbian rights in the archival profession. Finally, I'd like to conclude with some lessons learned from my research. First, I'd like to define archives. Archives, according to the SAA glossary, can be defined as, quote, materials created or received by a person, family, or organization, public or private, in the conduct of their affairs and preserved because of the enduring value contained in the information they contain or as evidence of the functions and responsibilities of their creator. We might boil that down, however, and simply say that they are, in effect, permanent records. They are worthy, in other words, of being kept and by implication of being reused. Another important concept that my talk pivots on is that of social justice. I'd like to boil down social justice to three points. First, social justice hinges on eliminating the structural and institutional dominance and oppression of folks. Second, social justice presupposes the equal moral worth of each human being. Third, social justice work counters the use of the written and unwritten record to preserve power and control of information and access, and thus to, thus to perpetuate structural and institutional dominance and oppression. I'd like to move on and briefly underline the, the general importance of archives. First, I think we can argue that archives play an essential role in the writing of history. And this is because of their documentary possibilities. In other words, we might say, documentation helps determine what gets written and in turn, what gets legitimized. Second, archives have played an increasingly important role in memory. We might subsume that under the notion of the politics of remembering and forgetting. Finally, we might consider archives with respect to accountability. Archives and written records of all sort, in fact, have long been crucial in ensuring citizenship and rights and responsibilities of citizens. I'd like to provide just a short bit of historical context before I move on to the cases that I mentioned I would address in the introduction. Now, first and foremost, we have about 4,000, at least 4,000 really, years of written records. And as one scholar has noted, quote, history has seen archives move from fortresses, protecting records for king and crown, to warehouses, preserving materials for scholarship and study, to bastions of democracy, holding archives to serve the public good. In other words, archivy has been democratized over time. To narrow things down a little bit, I'd like to underline that in the United States, written documents were absolutely foundational. So for example, if you look at things like the Mayflower Flower Compact, if you look at the original state constitutions, for example, my home state of Connecticut featured the first written state constitution, thus our license plates bear the charming slogan, Constitution State. These written documents were designed to ensure citizens had access to evidence to ensure in turn the accountability of democratically elected government officials. Similarly, written records allowed citizens to have access to public records. And it's worth underscoring again that this was quite, quite nearly unprecedented. Now there are two strands in terms of archives in the United States. One is public records and the second is historical manuscripts. Now the public records tradition emerges out of what I just mentioned in terms of written documents. The historical manuscripts tradition, however, took a bit of a different trajectory. Historical manuscripts 
were collected and edited indeed generally by folks who were interested in securing the promise of what they called the democratic experiment. In other words, they saw the United States as a great model for the world's future and they were determined to preserve evidence of such. Now, of course, this evidence was of a very particular kind, namely it applied to what we now call great white men. But at any rate, after the Civil War, history as a professional occupation gained ground. Many of the folks who were involved with both public records and historical manuscripts parlayed that interest into being some of the first historians. Now you'll note here that I have put the word scientific in quotation marks. Scientific history essentially emanated out of German practices and models. What scientific history fetishized essentially was objectivity, factuality, and secularity. It aimed for professionalization, and the first PhD in history, in fact, was granted in the late 1960s. But like the historical manuscripts tradition, scientific history, even as it fetishized documents that were ostensibly neutral, instantiated a white male Protestant bias. Thus, as we look back on these two historical traditions and how they informed the writing of history, and in turn, the keeping of memory, we need to think about several questions. What materials are preserved? Who archives those materials and where do they archive them? And finally, perhaps most important, who can access these materials and who indeed can use them? I'd like to move on to discuss my first example, which concerns segregation in archives and what I've titled here, The Strange Career of Jim Crow Archives. Now the photographs on the right, one is Dr. John Hope Franklin and one is Dr. Helen Edmonds. And I'll speak a little bit about them in a minute because they provide some extraordinary and really quite heart-rending examples of what archival segregation meant in the segregated South. Now postbellum, after reconstruction ended, that is to say in 1877, a movement was launched that essentially sought to, as they put it, redeem the South from the devastating losses of the Civil War. Part and parcel of that, of course, was rebuilding the South's economy. And yet we also need to think more broadly about redeeming, as it were, the South's culture. And the lost cause myth was born. So as part and parcel of that memorialization, Southerners turned to history and to the forging of collective memory now, as we know from the past several years of reading our newspapers, monuments in the South have received a great deal of attention. And in fact, in my alma mater of the University of North Carolina is one conspicuous example. Yet we should not overlook a, a, a complementary aspect of that memorialization, which is intellectual memorialization. And historical manuscripts and public records were a vital component of that reconstruction. And as I've noted here, as you can see, the reconstruction not only of the physical, but also of the intellectual landscape in the South. Segregation swept the South, both de jure and de facto, after the end of Reconstruction. Plessy v. Ferguson, for example, in 1896, codified separate but equal. And yet there was perhaps an equally powerful impulse at work, de facto segregation segregation as baked into laws and folkways. So on the one hand, you had electoral disfranchisement of African Americans, and the vast majority of Southern states had achieved this in the 1890s and indeed by the turn of the 20th century, but also folkways obtruded. So for example, telephones, Bibles, restrooms, segregation had an indeed peculiar career. What was also striking is that even as disfranchisement occurred, Southern states were memorializing further their records by erecting state historical societies, local historical societies, local libraries, and so on and so forth. What was quite striking, however, is the implementation of segregation in these spaces. For example, you see here that the State Library of North Carolina in 1901 actually mandated segregation in its reading rooms. It was the only Southern state to do so. So essentially what you have is an intellectual infrastructure that includes Southern college campuses, state and local historical societies, archives and libraries, and quite soon professional organizations starting in about the 19 teens. 
And these professional organizations struggled with how to accommodate, if they chose to at all, African-American scholars. Now what Jim Crow points us to are several things. As African-American scholars sought to use the resources of these local and historical societies and libraries, they confronted incredulous whites. Folks who said, well, why? How in the world can an African-American have the mental capacity to use these resources? For that matter, they wondered how they could accommodate African-Americans simply in terms of the material they held. White scholars were often hostile, white archivists and librarians equally so. And so, we've, so what we face here simply is that the archives is never a neutral space, what you might call spatial geography. And so an astonishing jerry-rigged system, some enforced by policy and some not, grew up around historical libraries and archives in the South. So for example, when John Hope Franklin was pursuing his first book, which was published in 1941, he encountered a bewildering variety of restrictions. He went, for instance, to Louisiana, the State Archives, in 1945. Well, wouldn't you know African-American scholars weren't welcome there? Funny enough, the country was celebrating victory over Japan Day, and so the archivists let John Hope Franklin use the materials as long as it was, you might say, on the sly, as long as that was kept in secret. A second consideration is the idea of separate and unequal access and service. We think about Plessy v. Ferguson and that famous line of separate but equal. And that famous line that was kept in place till Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. And yet archivists betrayed their professional career just as did historians. They believed in African Americans' intellectual inferiority and they abided by often unwritten policies of who was welcome and who was not. The written policies that existed, moreover, often used vague and ambiguous language. They would talk about restrictions, but restrictions without subjects. And thus, individual archivists and librarians were allowed a profound amount of discretion. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that the State Library of North Carolina mandated segregation so when John Hope Franklin came there, he was at a loss because there was nowhere for him to sit. And as a result, room was found for him in the stacks. Ironically, you might say, as he reflected later, he got his own office because he was not permitted to sit with other white scholars. Now another example I'd like to share with you also comes from North Carolina. Now you see on the right, Dr. The Helen right. Edmonds, who obtained a PhD at Ohio State and who was a longtime faculty member at what we, uh, what we now know as North Carolina Central University. She also was writing on North Carolina and history of race relations as she pursued her dissertation. She contacted the University of North Carolina Libraries, Southern, Southern Historical Collection, Collection in particular, and asked if she could use the materials. This was a time of profound upheaval and she cautioned, and she cautioned or excuse me, she assured them that she was not interested in integrating the universe or indeed in causing any disruption in any way. She was only interested, that is, in accessing the material. A reference librarian wrote back to her and said, Dr. Edmonds, we would be happy to host you. We look forward to it. We have made arrangements for restrooms across campus. And so as these two so examples these two, show, yeah. scholars were scholars forced, forced into these extraordinary, extraarinary, extraordinary, extraordinary and terrible, terrible arrangements terrible simply by dint of their skin color. color. So maybe it was, so maybe using, it was restaurant. using a restaurant, it was being maybe sequestered, it was being sequestered in, a in a separate area. But by and large, by it, was and large it was intended, intended to preserve, to preserve Jim Crow supremacy, supremacy, both de facto both de facto and de jure. And de jure. Another lesson that this Another lesson words is a lack of accountability. A lack of accountability. A lack of accountability. Archivists. Archivists. To the historical to the record. Historical record. To the unbiased to the scientific record. historical record, more precisely, record, more precisely that they claimed to enshrine. They claimed to enshrine. In other words, one might argue words, they betrayed argue. their professional creed by hewing to these policies, whether written 
or unwritten. And so there are countless examples of scholars seeking to use materials and finding that they were closed or finding materials missing or finding their efforts denigrated by the whites who worked there. As late as 1954, in fact, the year of Brown versus Board of Education, Lawrence D. Reddick, Chicago, University of Chicago PhD, who was a professor at Atlanta University, wrote a poignant article called simply, Where Can a Southern Negro Read a Book? And even after 1954, progress was glacial. The 1964 Civil Rights Act, of course, struck down legal discrimination, and yet it persisted insidiously for years thereafter. Now, the strange career of Jim Crow archives extends to another person that I'd like to discuss with you, which is Dr. Harold T. Pinkett. Now, Pinkett was born in 1914 in Jim Crow, Maryland. Some called it Mississippi on the Chesapeake. When Pinkett was growing up in Jim Crow, Maryland, not only did he grow up in segregated circumstances, his father was a minister, and his family managed to eke by. But Harold Pinkett was a quite fortunate in that his parents instilled in him a desire for education. Pinkett, that is to say, comprised part of what W.E.B. Du Bois called the talented 10th, that fraction of African Americans who could attend college and serve as future race leaders, he thought. So Pinkett subsequently attended Morgan State University in Maryland. He went on to earn a master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania and started doctoral study at Columbia University, but then a familiar story happened. He ran out of money. By hook and by crook, he thought he would sit and take the civil service exam for archivists, and he passed it. Now, it's important to note here that federal service, regardless of its shortcomings, and believe me, they were severe, nonetheless extended extraordinary opportunity for African Americans to join the middle class. Thus, folks like Pinkett, who are college educated, often joined the federal ranks. So Harold Pinkett went to Washington. And he arrived in Washington. Washington, too, was a Jim Crow city. So Pinkett arrived right as World War II was gaining ground, you might say. In other words, in early 1942. Now, something had happened, meanwhile, that allowed Pinkett to be hired, essentially, by the National Archives, which is to say, as many of you probably know, the March on Washington movement. Now, the march resulted in an executive order that established the FEPC, the Fair Employment Practices Committee. And in turn, that pressured federal government agencies to employ African Americans. So Pinkett arrived in Jim Crow, Washington. And on the one hand, there was this new opportunity for folks like him. But on the other hand, there was tremendous adversity waiting. For example, the civil rights laws of 1872 and 1873 simply vanished in 1900. They disappeared off the statute books. Nobody knows how or why. Washington was a southern city. As a result, Jim Crow was firmly in effect as an unofficial policy. So Pinkett arrived in Washington, and shortly thereafter, he'd barely gotten his feet wet at the National Archives, a point to which I'll return in a moment, and was drafted into a Jim Crow army. Now, Pinkett served the country nobly in various theaters. He accrued various awards for his service. And it's important to notice that he was not relegated to service, to menial service, to cooking and cleaning like so many African Americans were. He was in a distinguished training role. But here we want to notice, as he did, the importance of the double V campaign. In other words, victory over the Japanese, the Italians, and the Germans, and victory in turn over racism at home. But I'd like to speak a bit about the National Archives. Now, the National Archives was established in 1934. Pinkett worked there from 1943 to 1979. And the National Archives was a peculiar place because when Franklin Roosevelt established it, he was looking to align political supporters. And that, I'm afraid, meant aligning a lot, aligning his interests with that of Southern Democrats. And Southern Democrats, as you know, had a rather peculiar position on racial issues. So, for example, the first archivist of the United States, Robert Connor, 
was a UNC history professor. And it was no coincidence that Harold Pinkett called it the era of the Confederate archives. And the crazy thing was that when Pinkett arrived, he thought everybody, his coworkers, that is to say, was quite nice. No doubt it was odd being the only person of color when the other people of color tended to occupy service and janitorial positions. But at any rate, he rose through the ranks of NARA. And in fact, in 1959, he became the first to head an administrative unit there. Subsequently, he became the highest ranking General Services Administration employee who was African American by his retirement in 1979. Now, one mentee of Pinkett's commented that given the adversity he faced in the era of the Confederate archives, to get to the position that he did, he may as well have had to, quote, walk on water twice. Now, the National Archives was deeply imbricated with the Society of American Archivists. The SAA had been founded in 1936, and until the mid-1960s, it was dominated by white Protestant men from the National Archives. And yet Pinkett also made inroads here. He was the first African-American SAA fellow, the first African-American editor of the American Archivist, and the first African-American to serve on SAA Council. On the other hand, he lost a close, close candidacy for president to future archivist of the United States, Bob Warner, in 1975. Among his most important legacies, however, was his contributing to the Minority Student Award, which was renamed the Harold T. Pinkett Minority Student Award in the late 1990s. I wanted to mention a couple things about Pinkett before I transition. One thing that was striking is that I've mentioned scientific history and this faith in written evidence. And what's so paradoxical about African-American historians such as Pinkett, Pinkett earned a PhD in that subject, was his faith in the record his faith in the record's ability to illuminate black achievements and to vitiate stereotypes. He didn't grapple, in other words, with the irrationality of racism. As an historian, he went on to a great deal of success as, as well. He presided both over the Agricultural History Society and the Forest History Society, the first African American to do either. By his personal example, moreover, he was part of the civil rights movement. One of his mentees praised his quote unquote quiet fire. He was a mentor to a next generation of African-American archivists. And ultimately, he provided an expiring, inspiring example. He expanded the scope of possibility, you might say, for archivists of color. By the same token, as he noted, Perhaps other folks accepted him more readily because he did not portend a substantial structural change at the National Archives or the Society of American Archivists. One of his important legacies, although he did not serve on the task force, was to make suggestions upon its, its tactics. The SAA Task Force on Minorities coalesced in 1981, as you can see here, and lasted until 1987, whence the Archivists and Archives of Color Roundtable was founded. I think it is fair to say then that Harold Pinkett, as he once titled a book review of his, was indeed a trailblazer for archivists and for historians of color. Now, the third topic I'd like to discuss is feminism in archives. And I want to carry over from Pinkett just a moment, because what was striking is that when Pinkett was writing about civil rights and diversity and inclusivity in the archives profession, he suggested that the Task Force on Minorities take a page out of feminism's book, and that's what I'd like to turn to now. The context in which feminism and civil rights and gay rights arose is what we might call part and parcel of the post-war rights revolution, and really, in a sense, the notion of rights consciousness. We had generations, new generations that were, for example, coming home from serving their country like Pinkett. We had generations who were tired of being ensconced in the feminine mystique. We had folks who were sick of being invisible, being deemed mentally ill. Thus demographic change must be cited as an incredibly important motivating factor 
in the changes that we see in archives, in archivists, and in their activism and in their pursuit for social justice. Now, I want to focus for a moment on the Committee on the Status of Women, which was SAA's official committee, which coalesced in 1972 along with the unofficial Women's Caucus and Interest Group. Now, COSA was established in 1972, as I mentioned, and that was a, a propitious year, for example, things like Title IX, Our Bodies, Ourselves, uh, Roe v. Wade was on the horizon. So there was, there was some reason for optimism, you might say. Now, the committee had several priorities. One was documenting women's experiences. As I mentioned a moment ago, neither the public records tradition nor the historical manuscripts tradition had much room for anybody but the great white men. So nobody really knew what sources were out there for writing women's history, with a few exceptions, the Smith Collection, Radcliffe's College, Schlesinger Collection. And so one part of COSA's work was to document women's experiences by finding out how history could be written. So a second and closely related priority was to encourage scholarship by and about women, what one member called, quote unquote, raising Cleo's consciousness. A third priority in line with the documentary impulse and encouraging scholarship and historiography by and about women was fighting job discrimination and salary inequities in the archival profession itself. Now, at one point, salary parity was in such a bad condition that it was down at 60%. In other words, female archivists made 60% of men. The most recent factor we have, however, suggests that in librarianship, at least, that number has grown to 89%. Suffice to say, the battle is not finished. Another important aspect of representation and equal treatment was equitable participation in the Society of American Archivists. Women had always been part of the Society of American Archivists despite GWM's domination until the mid 1960s. In fact, when the society was founded, 28% of its membership was women. And yet, even in the middle 50s, only a third of membership were women. As a result, their participation was disproportionately low. In other words, they did not even receive 33% of the number of presidents, fellows, committees, and participants. And that was a, this was an agenda that COSA embraced heartily and made a great deal of progress in. Though again, I should issue the caveat, the battle is still not won. And as we can see here, women now constitute, uh, according to the most recent figures, that is to say, 82% of SAA membership. Now, the final struggle that COSA undertook that we, we should appreciate is that of the Equal Rights Amendment, which in fact was first passed in 1972 and ultimately failed in 1982, 10 years later, when the failure to ratify by two thirds of the states finally came down. We have seen it revived recently. So again, constant refrain might be well, the battle has not yet been won. I'd like to move on to another marginalized group. And this was another group that was struggling with rights consciousness and engaging the American public in a battle for civil rights and civil liberties after the Second World War. And that is queer folks and archives and archivists. Now, queer folks struggled with invisibility, as I noted earlier. For example, the first DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 1953, classified mental, or excuse me, classified what they called homosexuality at the time as a mental illness. The American Psychiatric Association also did until 1972. The flagship journal, The American Archivists, remained silent on gays or lesbians. In fact, in 1975, future president Andrea Hinding first used the term gay in a published article. She said we were forced to reckon with social changes. And she mentioned gay people as well as long-haired people to give you a sense of the time. Now in 1980, the term homosexual first appeared in The American Archivist. So this sort of subterranean momentum ultimately came to a head. And in 1986 at the SA Annual, folks had a panel devoted to gays and lesbians. 
And I've included Elizabeth Knowlton in the Georgia State Archives quotation here because I think it quite nicely encapsulates the challenges that queer folks faced. Quote, even when the documents of gays do arrive at the archives, the semi-conscious archivist will studiously avoid looking at them as homosexual papers, will deny that such records are in the archives, or will claim that it is impossible to help researchers looking for either the documents of the gay movement or for clues to illuminate the lives of our gay brothers and sisters. It will not surprise you to learn that many queer folks found common cause with COSA and in fact, shared membership in both of these groups. Another important thing to recognize, we hear a lot about community archives these days and queer folks were instrumental, absolutely crucial in establishing community archives because in fact they were invisible. They could not make their identity or their preferences public. And as a result, many archives that contained LGBTQ material gestated in individuals' collections, and indeed even in their apartments or personal houses. The Lesbian History Archives is one example. The One Archives in California first started in a gentleman's apartment in 1942. So community archives provided a vital, vital institution for what we now consider archives and archiving of queer folks. And community archives offered a sense, not only of, of visibility, but also a sense of democratized processes, self-definition and community ownership. And a final point to make is that they didn't just save written records. They also engaged in material culture. And that's something, the legacy of which we see quite vividly today. Now, just as the Committee on the Status for Women fought for feminist goals and the Task Force on Minorities gave way to the Archives and Archivists of Color Roundtable, so too did queer folks establish their own roundtable to lead their cause. And that was the Lesbian and Gay Archivist Roundtable, which was established in 1989. And again, as we look at Lager's goals and achievements, we see how closely they aligned with those of the women's movement. In other words, how symbiotic they were and how oppressed and marginalized groups may well have learned from each other. So we see with Lager's goals, things like establishing and maintaining contacts with archives not aligned with SAA. Sessions at annual meetings that focused on queer related topics. A newsletter, in other words, taking control of public perception by issuing one's own publication. Serving as a clearinghouse for information on historical material and also saving that material itself. And then finally raising the consciousness of membership in the SAA about the very importance of preserving queer materials. Perhaps their most important achievement was the Lavender Legacies Directory. And Lavender Legacies was pathbreaking because it, in the same way that the WHSS had in 1975, illuminated different repositories that actually had queer materials that might have gone unknown and that I assure you had gone unexploited by historians and scholars. And so Lavender Legacies was a great step forward in the documentary imperative of queer scholarship. Now, one thing also to note is that Lager changed its name in the mid 2000s. In the interest of inclusivity, it is now called the Diverse Sexuality and Gender Section, DSGS. And so what we can see here is the morphing priorities of groups such as this over time and their interest in becoming more inclusive. And I think that's something which we should underscore and which we should appreciate. I'd like to leave you with a final quotation. Nancy McGovern, former SAA president as well as Lager member, issued this really rather wonderful call in her presidential address. Quote, we are included SAA, archives, and archivists are part of a collaborative future with affiliated domains and professions. We are inclusive. Our members, policies, practice, collections, repositories are inclusive. We have diverse diversity. No exclusionary ism is okay in our community." End quote. And as wonderfully aspirational as McGovern's speech was, we may only hope that someday it will become reality. I would like to close 
with several conclusions. So first and foremost, as I hope my talk has underlined, archives and archivists exert power over history and memory, over what exists and over who can access the material that does in fact exist. Another thing I want to uh, make mention of is the lengthy history of social justice work. Now, of course, in LIS and in archives, the notion of social justice has gained increasing cachet over the past 10 years. And yet I think it's quite important that we realize that there were pathbreakers, pathbreakers to whom we owe our appreciation, pathbreakers who hidden, whose hidden histories need, in other words, to be recovered. We also might remember along these lines that as Faulkner famously said, the past is not dead. In fact, it is not even past. So we look, for example, let us say at the feminization of archival work, in other words, the devaluation of archival work, the relegation of archival work, paralleling librarianship, into a pink collar profession. Something else to emphasize, people matter. People who are willing to lead, who are willing to show courage, who are willing to break new, brown, new ground and indeed to suffer the consequences. That being said, Political activity matters. We look, for example, at the FEPC. We look at Brown v. Board. We look at the Civil Rights Act. We look at the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. So in other words, we can fight a war on cultural terms, but we cannot neglect policy and politics. A fifth point that I'd like to make concerns professionalism, membership, democracy, and politics. So we must ask, what is the political responsibility, if any, of a professional organization? We must, moreover, ask how democracy works. For example, if we look at the Equal Rights Amendment, a majority of SAA membership did not support SAA siding publicly with the ERA. So this is extraordinary food for thought, I think. As a corollary to that, we must ask how different groups speak or represent their community members. For instance, did the Committee on the Status for Women speak for all women archivists? Did Lager speak for all queer folks? Relating to that, we must explore the challenge of intersections and coalitions. For example, in 1986, as Lager was trying to get off the ground, they contacted the Archives and Archivists of Color Roundtable and asked if they were interested in forming a broader umbrella group. AARC was not interested. When we look moreover at the dissolution of COSW in 1998, what happened was these groups were rolled into an umbrella task force on diversity. But what's paradoxical, unlike AARC and Lager, the coalition of task force on diversity caused a permanent breach of friendship between the then head of COSW and the head of the task force. They had been dear friends. They never spoke again after that change was made. We also need to consider the allure of separatism, of having one's own space, you might say, intellectually and physically. How does that interact with, does it interact with interests in coalitions for broader or perhaps greater purposes? How, in other words, can appropriate balance be found? We also need to be concerned about being portrayed as interest groups or being tokenized as individuals. Finally, as I suspect these examples show, we need to consider strategy and tactics. In terms of social justice, incrementalism seems to have prevailed. What is more, we might conclude that various groups have fought their struggles on existing terrain. They have tried to promote change, in other words, from within. Is that, we might ask, the best choice? Now, as I hope these seven conclusions, and indeed they are questions as well, will leave you with food for thought. I thank you for your time and for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions from the audience.
I would ask you to use the Zoom chat feature. Thank you very much. So yes, there are absolutely roles for Drexel students interested in taking part in archives research at Drexel. Uh, the previous slide I showed you um, has the articles on which I have based this talk, and I have been wonderfully lucky to have some rewarding uh, excuse me, collaborations with master's students as well as PhD students. Um, I was fortunate to have a student who helped me with the archival research um, on the Committee on the Status for Women paper. So that was a really wonderful collaboration. Um, I've been talking with a number of other students about these historical projects and um, I'm delighted to work with students and I found collaboration rewarding indeed. All right, thank you so much, Alex. That was fantastic and very interesting. Um, certainly your presentation seems germane to today's politics. Yesterday I was listening to the uh, impeachment hearings and I kept thinking how fundamental role some of these um, foundational documents played and the role of archives in preserving our history and documents. So thank you everyone for coming, for listening to our, our uh, webinar. The next one in the series will be December 18th. Professor Gina Hu Yu will present Using Emerging Technology to Support Health. If you're interested in applying to the Drexel Masters of Science and in Information, we certainly encourage you to do so. You can email me, Denise Augusto, at DEA22 at Drexel.edu for more information. Again, that's DEA22 at Drexel.edu. And I can tell you about our program and contact you, 